went down to the river Jordan, where John baptized three. When I walked the devil in hell, says Johnny baptized me. I say, roll, and roll. There was a new movement in America. The West was now open, and people were on the move. Where people go, so goes the gospel. How did evangelism move to the new American West? Was it different than the East? We will look at both of the implements for evangelism in the West, the circuit riders and the camp meetings. The West had been closed to settlements since the Peace Treaty of 1763 that ended the Seven Years' War. This all changed with the conclusion of the Revolutionary War. The West was now open, and people could not move fast enough to secure this new land. So surely, as the people moved, so did the church. Unfortunately, this was not the case. The brick-and-mortar church was too content to move with the people. The established denominations of Congregationalists and Anglicans were settled firmly within their original colonies. The Presbyterians, Baptists, and the Methodists were more flexible and developed a new plan to seek the loss as they moved west. They invented the circuit rider. Where were the people going? On this map, we see several things. First, the red lines indicate the routes that the gospel flowed after the settlers. These paths were not only the roads west for settlers, but also the routes that circuit riders would take spreading the good news. It is often referred to as the movement of revivals of the Second Great Awakening. You can see that the push from the north and the mid-Atlantic reached deep into the Midwest. It left the comforts of the known and reached deep into the unknown and often dangerous reaches of the frontier. The second thing that this map shows us in the upper right-hand portion is an area called the Burnt Over District. This district was named by Charles Finney, a very popular and famous evangelist of the early and mid-1800s. The reason he called this area the Burnt Over District was it had become so saturated with evangelism that, as he said, there was no more fuel for the fire of the gospel. It had become absolutely saturated, and now they needed to move further west following the settlers to reach new converts. What exactly is a circuit rider? Circuit riders were men called to a hard life of seeking out souls in the wilderness to spread the hope found in the message of Christ. While it was never an official name, the circuit rider, or sometimes known as the saddlebag preacher, were clergy assigned to areas that either had no known established church or small congregations that could not support the salary of a full-time pastor. So these pastors packed up what little belongings they had into saddlebags, purchased the best horse they could find, and kept moving. Sometimes their circuits that they followed would take up to five to six weeks for them to ride the entire circuit. They often faced hostile Indians, extreme weather, and the occasional desperado, but still, the gospel burned in their bones just like Jeremiah. This is Peter Cartwright. He's an example of a circuit rider. Born in 1785 in Nelson County, Virginia, and he died in 1872 in the Illinois Territory, he moved to Kentucky at the age of 15. He was converted at a camp meeting as part of the 1800 revival in Logan County, Kentucky, in a Presbyterian congregation. At the age of 16, one year later in 1802, he became a preacher and was ordained by Francis Asbury in 1806 in the Methodist Episcopalian Church. By 1812, at the age of 27, he became the district superintendent of the Episcopal Methodist Church for the Illinois area. And he held that job for 35 years. Also, during that exact same year, he also served in the U.S. military as a chaplain during the War of 1812. He says in his autobiography that his district on the Grand Prairie, which was in Illinois, 
was over five, 400 miles long, in which he traveled to each and every one of those churches. He was a very colorful man that had many different interesting things in his life. He ran against Abraham Lincoln for Congress and lost. While he had had little education growing up, he was a big supporter and before he died, had actually helped to start three different colleges. He always considered himself a backwards, backwoods pastor until the very day he died. Our next circuit rider, Francis Erzberry, was born in 1745 in England. At the age of 18, he met a man named John Wesley at a Methodist meeting who would appoint him as a lay preacher later that year. By the age of 22, he was appointed as a traveling preacher and volunteered in 1771 to come to America as John Wesley's assistant. Within his first 17 days, he had already preached in New York and Philadelphia, well on his way to becoming the greatest of all circuit riders. During his first year, he preached in 25 different settlements as part of his first circuit, and by 1776, when the war broke out, he and James Dempster were the only Methodist ministers to remain in the colonies. In 1784, John Wesley appointed Asbury along with Thomas Coke as co-superintendents for the Methodist Church in America. But that didn't stop Asbury. He continued to uh, find uh, opportunities to preach every single day. He'd preach to people wherever he found them, in courthouses, public houses, fields, public squares, outside or inside, anywhere he could be, he talked about the gospel. For the rest of his life, he traveled on an average of 6,000 miles each year. His circuit was the entire country of America. It is said that he preached at least one sermon every day. Under his direction, the Methodist Church grew from only 1,200 members to over 214,000 and at least 700 ordained ministers. Remember, Peter Cartwright was one of those ministers. He ordained the very first black minister in the U.S., Richard Allen, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. After recovering from ill health that had kept him down for over a year, in March of 1816, he preached his last sermon in Richmond, Virginia. He died six days later in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. John Wigger wrote a biography about Francis Asbury called The American Saint Francis Asbury and the Methodist. In that, he is quoted as saying, Francis Asbury was w more widely recognized face to face than even George Washington or Thomas Jefferson. You see, he had traveled to every state at least once a year. He had ordained two to three thousand preachers in his lifetime and had given ten thousand sermons. He had crossed the Appalachian Mountains sixty times and traveled over one hundred and thirty thousand miles and had met more people face to face than any other American. He was the epitome of the circuit rider. The other implement for the set spread of the gospel was the camp meeting. The camp meetings were more than a gathering of people to hear a traveling preacher give a sermon. It was a life-changing event that could last for days, weeks, or months. Circuit riders or pastors would arrange to meet in a general area, and because the West had so few buildings, these events were often held in open spaces. The pastors would take turns preaching with music playing in between. Going from morning until deep into the night, people would come and go, but the preaching never stopped. They would travel great distances to attend these services, often bringing their entire families and camping around the open areas, hence the name Camp Meetings. One of the first camp meetings, called the Cane Ridge Revival, took place in Kentucky from August the 6th through the 13th of 1801. It was at the response of Barton Stone, a Presbyterian minister who had invited Methodist and Baptist to take communion in a true ecumenical outreach. 20,000 people heard the message of the gospel at this one Cane Ridge meeting. Some pastors thought that it would be best for people to understand how these meetings uh, were organized, and Reverend Gorham produced a manual on the organization, history, and even the hymns that would be sung for camp meetings. What you see here is an example of his book on the manual for camp meetings. In conclusion, we can see that even though denominations that were firmly planted in the East 
tended to stay with their brick-and-mortar establishments. New denominations that were more flexible and more ecumenical and were open to new methods would not falter from evangelizing the new lands. As people left the burnt-over district, circuit riders followed. As camp meetings converted settlers, often the campgrounds were converted to brick-and-mortar churches. Where the people go, so goes the gospel. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down.